the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, followers of Jesus, on his final journey to his final death, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Jerusalem was shook up. And the city was already, it was already bursting with pilgrims from all over the known world coming to Jerusalem to celebrate and commemorate God's ancient deliverance of his people when they had been in slavery in Egypt and how he had miraculously brought them out. They were all gathering in Jerusalem. The city was bustling. But when Jesus of Nazareth came walking in on the back of a colt, it was like an earthquake had hit the city. The whole city was shook up. Who is this? Who is this man riding into Jerusalem with these ancient songs of praise on the lips of the people? Who is this man who comes in so humbly, yet so triumphantly? Who is this? What's he coming to do? Why is he here? Why are the people praising him? What are the Romans going to do? Who is this? The answer the citizens of Jerusalem got from the crowds wasn't very helpful. This is Jesus, the prophet of, from Nazareth in Galilee. Now the pilgrims, they knew that Jesus was somebody great. They knew he was somebody worth praising. But they were confused. They weren't really sure. They had no idea who Jesus really was or what he was coming to do. Why he was entering Jerusalem so triumphantly yet so humbly. Was he a great teacher? Was he a prophet? Was he an earthly savior? They were all confused. Who is Jesus? There's still a lot of confusion even today. They ask most people and they'll recognize and identify that Jesus of Nazareth did exist. But many will tell you that the real Jesus, the real Jesus is shrouded in myth and legend. That, that really he's no more, he was no more than a regular guy with some great qualities and his followers happened to make him out to be something he wasn't. Many will tell you that he's a great example for their lives. Even a great teacher. But he's no different than any other great leader or teacher or moral example in human history. Some say he was a revolutionary. Others say his story is tragic because he died so young for such an idealistic cause in the face of such brutal oppression and jealous hatred. Some might say he was the greatest liar of all, or even a lunatic. Some might even perhaps say that he is true God and true man, our Lord and Savior. But like all those people in the crowds, all those pilgrims and the citizens of Jerusalem, most people don't know who Jesus really is. Now he only, and, and so the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Or does your picture of Jesus or who Jesus is fall short? Is it perhaps even a somewhat incomplete like it was for those pilgrims who were there for Passover? Well, it all comes down to how we respond to that question from the citizens of Jerusalem. Who is this? Jesus had only a mile and a half to go. Many days, many months, many years had passed, had led up to this day when Jesus would make his final journey into Jerusalem to wage his final battle. That journey had started all the way back in the Garden of Eden when our first parents, Adam and Eve, had, had disobeyed God's holy command, yet in his grace, God had given them a promise of a Savior who was going to crush the serpent's head final leg of that journey. The final leg of that journey had, had started about 33 years before when an angel appeared to a young virgin named Mary and told her, you're going to be the mother of the Son of God. The home stretch had started weeks before with a brief glimpse of Christ's true heavenly glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. But now all that lay between Jesus and his final battle was a mile and a half of road between the little village called Bethphage and the city of Jerusalem. It was a mile and a half. 
Now, Jesus could have been like any of the other Passover pilgrims who just walked his way up to, into the city of Jerusalem, gone along right along with the crowds that were packing the city and bursting out, out all throughout it. He, he didn't have to, he wasn't weary from the journey. He, he didn't need to take a load off. But Jesus wasn't an ordinary Passover pilgrim making an ordinary Passover pilgrimage. In fact, uh, he wasn't going to be entering the, the city of Jerusalem like so many other of these masses of pilgrims who were, who were making their way to the holy city. That wasn't going to be that way because that wasn't how God had foretold it through his prophets. You see, about 500 years before to the prophet Zechariah, the Lord had said this, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt full of a donkey. The Lord had already foretold this important day. And so Jesus was going to be going in in a unique way. Of course, Jesus knew this because the words of the prophet were his own words. So Jesus assigned two of his disciples, gave them a special task to go into the village of Bethphage with some very specific instructions. Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Pretty specific instructions, considering that Jesus didn't come from around there. He grew up up in Galilee. He, didn't, he wasn't necessarily familiar with Bethphage and the villages around the city of Jerusalem. And it's not like Jesus gave his disciples these instructions. Now when you get into the village, look for a livestock dealer, find the best ride you can get, and bring it back here, and if you can't go over to Bethany, maybe there's a livestock dealer over there. I'll, you know, get me a ride. Didn't quite work that way. Before we see Jesus' disciples, uh, prepare, uh, it, we, Jesus described what they were going to find in exact detail. It wasn't just any donkey, but it was a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Jesus instructed his disciples that they were to untie both the donkey and the colt, and they were to bring them back to him. But he also anticipated the very real objection that was going to follow. Put yourself in the owner's sandals. Why are you untying my donkey? Why are you taking my donkey and her colt? Jesus knew that objection was going to come up, and so he told his disciples what to say. Tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The donkey and her colt would be borrowed by the Lord himself. And then the donkey and the colt would be returned as soon as possible after Jesus had used them. <laughs> Jesus knew that the owner wouldn't object to that. Just think about that. All he had to say, the Lord has use for them, and the owner would just let them go. Jesus knew that. And he knew that the owner would gladly loan out his donkey and colt for the Lord's use. The disciples didn't question Jesus, but instead were told they went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Before we see Jesus' disciples prepare his ride, let's stop and think about what we've just heard and seen. Jesus has predicted in exact detail what his disciples would find, what the owner would say, and how he was going to fulfill the prophetic scriptures. Who is this who makes such a perfectly fulfilled prediction? not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He's not even a great leader. He's not even making a lucky guess. Instead, here we have Jesus, who knows what his suffering and death are going to do to his disciples in the coming days, how they're going to fill them with uncertainty, how that's going to fill them with uncertainty, how they're going to scatter, they're going to fear for their lives, they're going to go into hiding. He knows all that. And so in a very simple way, the Lord assures them. That he's the all-knowing God, and not just the all-knowing God, but that he's in control of all things, even down to the smallest detail of the fact of which cult he was going to ride into Jerusalem. So the disciples brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. Mark sheds a little, the, the gospel writer Mark sheds a little bit more light on this as he tells us when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Instead of riding the adult donkey, which would have been used to bearing a burden, Jesus chooses to ride an unbroken colt into pilgrim-packed Jerusalem. 
Now the, the mother, the donkey, may have gone along just to calm that, that colt down, but even here we see an example of Jesus, who he really is, of his power uh, over all creation, really. We're also told that when the disciples, went, uh, when they brought the, the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. The disciples, they... Uh, they gave him, a, a, instead of all the, uh, the beautiful tooled saddles that you probably could have found somewhere in the, land, in, the, in the land of Israel, he rides on some coats, a little bit of padding, on his way into Jerusalem. See, we see here both Jesus as the all-knowing, all-powerful God, and we also see him as the humble rider. Remember why Jesus was going into Jerusalem. He was going to fight his final battle. He was fulfilling the ancient prophecy that your king comes to you. But see how humbly he approaches his battle. Think of all the horses, the mighty steeds that were probably available in the country, around Jerusalem and around the, the country of Israel, and yet Jesus chooses an unbroken colt of a donkey. He rides on cloaks of his disciples. And then there's his red carpet. Or maybe I suppose we should say his green and brown earth tone carpet. We're told a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus' red carpet was made out of coats and palm branches laid on the ground. There was nothing opulent about it, nothing really majestic and rich about it. And yet Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Now many of those people who were praising him there surely thought that maybe he was coming to throw off the Roman oppressors and finally take back the ancient throne of King David and establish a world empire. But when you take a closer look at this, and you know even some of his own disciples thought this, you take a closer look at how pathetic an image you have here. Here's Jesus riding in on a colt, walking on, or sitting on coats, and walking on coats and branches. It doesn't really look like someone who's about to take over the world. It doesn't look like someone who, who's about to throw off the mighty Romans. So why did Jesus come in humility? He wasn't a revolutionary. He wasn't an earthly savior. He wasn't going to be an earthly king with an earthly kingdom. Yet he was just as much a human being as he was true God, and he had a purpose in coming. This Jesus had a battle to fight, but not with the Romans, not even with the relig Jewish religious leaders. He had a battle to fight with sin and Satan and death. Jesus would endure suffering, but not because of a mistake on the battlefield or for his idealistic cause, but to suffer in your place and mine, because that was the path that was necessary for him to take to save you and me. Jesus was even going to suffer death, not for his own sins, but for yours and for mine. He was even going to die a criminal's death, a humiliating death. But again, not for himself, but for you and me. Jesus would still triumph in that final battle, even though he would allow his enemies to take his life. This Jesus... This Jesus had to be a real human being just like you and me, yet without sin, so that he could be the Savior that you and I so desperately need. So Jesus humbly rode into Jerusalem as it shook with his praises. You see, for a brief moment, the people in those crowds recognized Jesus for who he really was. Now the verse from Zechariah from which Matthew, uh, that Matthew quotes in our text here, it gives us a hint of why the people were so excited. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. Listen to the ancient song that's on their lips. Hosanna! Lord, save us! The pilgrim crowds were excited because the kingly Messiah was coming into Jerusalem. Hosanna! Lord, save us! Here was the one. Here was the one who was coming in righteousness, who was bringing salvation. Hosanna, Lord, save us. Here was the one from the line of David, the one who was coming to fight for their souls. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people praised him. Countless pilgrims took off their most prized, their most expensive possession, their cloaks. 
They didn't have much else with them. They took those cloaks off and they put them on the ground so this Jesus and his nervous donkey could make their way down the streets of Jerusalem. They cut palm branches off. Symbols of eternal life, of salvation, rejoicing, waving them in the air, praising this Jesus as the kingly Messiah, the king who is coming to bring salvation. Here was their Savior King. They couldn't praise Jesus enough. Hosanna in the highest, they cried out. But how soon they forgot or didn't realize what they were singing. The citizens of Jerusalem were wondering, who is this? Maybe you heard that in the song. Who is this King of Glory? And instead of calling him the King of Glory or the Lord Mighty in Battle or the Lord Almighty, oh, this is Jesus. He's the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And that's all he said. There was no nothing pointing. This is the Savior. This is the one whom God sent. There was no claim that Jesus was the Messiah. And days later, those same confused crowds called for his crucifixion. Eventually the journey came to an end. At some point Jesus got off the colt and the disciples put their cloaks back on. The crowds settled down and started getting ready for Passover and the donkey and her colt went back to Bethphage. But the battle was started. The final battle for our souls. That battle in the days that would follow would wage... It would be waged. It would rage on and on in the temple courts, in an upper room, in a in a in a garden spot under the stars, in the courts of, of the of the Jewish leaders and the Roman governor, on an ugly hill outside of Jerusalem, on a cross, and finally at a garden tomb that couldn't hold its occupant. We'll be following that journey in the coming days. But as you do, as you follow your Savior, ask yourself that question. Who is Jesus? We could be like the crowds and be confused. We could be like so many in our world today and think all kinds of things about Him. Or we could see what God's Word has told us. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a moral example. He's not just an earthly Messiah. He's our Lord and Savior. He's God, true God. He is a human being just like you, and yet without sin. He is the Savior we need, both God and man. And so with those crowds, we sing to the Savior King as we see Him go to war for us to fight that battle for you and me. Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Amen.